Hello everyone, and welcome to the Ubuntu Touch Q&A, the UbiPorts Foundation show discussing the development of Ubuntu Touch and our community's questions. This is episode 44, streamed live on February 16th, 2019. We are back, everyone. Uh, Fosdem got us for one week. Uh, <laughs> Fosdem's sickness got us the next week, but now we're back. <laughs> yep. Yep, everyone got sick at Fosdem. That, as far as I know, that happens every year. Me and not. me not. I was sick before Fosdem, so I was uh, right, already you sick. immunized. <laughs> you gave us all the sickness, is what you did. It's your fault. Oh, okay. oh yeah. <laughs> he was the one that brought this disease. <gasps> I will cover my mouth like. Uh, you need one of those time. masks. Yes. Yes. Flu masks. So I don't um, think they actually help, but you know. <laughs> they do. Yeah. Okay, so my name is Florian and there is also Dolphin and Marius. <laughs> I forgot that, didn't I? Oopsies. Yeah. Yeah. In case this is the first episode you're watching, um, yes. Um, that's basically what we do for the past 43 times also. Introducing okay. ourselves always like that, but it's I think it's a polite thing. How do you to forget say that? hello? Eh. How can you forget this? No. He has been so, bitten by the Fosdem flu, so that's why you yes. forget it. The As Fosdem we were luck. just alluding to, we were all at Fosdem, and we have a lot to talk about there. Yes. So yes. we're going to go around us and just talk about our experiences of Fosdem, and hopefully get some people to go next year, maybe, hint, hint. Mm -hmm. So Florian, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Um, it was my first time on Fosdem, so... Um, I was really, really excited by the by the sheer amount of people already um, on the airport on the evening on Friday when I arrived. You could see that something is going on because all those people heading into the city, and then getting off uh, more or less at the central station and then distributing themselves to all the possible hotels. And also the hotels were completely overbooked, so um, it was not easy to find a hotel. And we also didn't stay in the same hotel mainly. Um, it just depended on who booked when. So. But I got a, a, a nice hotel there, and then um, I had only to travel, I think, 15 minutes in the morning with the tram, which was totally overcrowded. So in my station, I still could get in, but the next two or three stations, people had to stay out of the train and wait for the next one, and the next one would go on in 15 minutes or so. So unfortunately, they, they did not increase the capacity of public transport because they knew there would be 5,000 people coming there. And then it started to snow heavily, and the weather was, in the first day on Saturday, was hmm, a little bit cold and snowy, but still, it was very exciting to come there. And um, You know what we did on that day? Pardon? We walked. We walked that oh, day. <laughs> Fosdem was held on the first and er, second and third of February in Brussels, Belgium, at, I can't pronounce the name of the venue. Um, it's a university, but it's very, uh, uh, the... Um, the independent university of something um, um i also cannot it's it's yeah you know it's for uh, them yeah it's for them <laughs> you can yeah. to answer so, the people in chat and then of course um i come there i'm completely unprepared what to talk to listen to and then i started to have uh or completely over um overbooked with ideas what i can can do and then i started to instead um just walk around and see what i can what I can get from the booths and from the from the people there, and um, I also started to to meeting people. Of course, uh, both of you guys and um, other people from the community, and um, what else? Um, I collected a bunch of business cards, and I maybe want to raise a few of them, not the business cards, but to to mention a few of the projects that I have visited and why actually. So the first one that I collected was uh, with the LibreOffice guys. Yeah? So I took the chance to talk to LibreOffice about uh, if we can improve the document viewer for Ubuntu Touch. Because what's really the issue with the document view, I mean, it basically works, but the loading time currently for certain document types is quite high. The rendering could be better and so on. So they were quite interested, didn't come back to me now but we might kick off some kind of project together with LibreOffice to have a nice mobile convergent document viewer that we can utilize. Yeah. Um, that was one thing. 
The second thing is that I talked with the Tor guys from the Tor project, or actually only with one guy. Um, and um, here it's about uh, can we integrate the Tor client into the OS that is really user friendly? You don't need a command line to start anything like the VPN setup. Um, and so I hope with the Tor guys that we can um, integrate this better than it is now or uh, not possible at all and make a nice UI for it. So I think it's a, a longer awaited feature in the community that we have a Tor uh, option besides the VPN. Yeah. Um, that was the second one. So hold on a second. What else do we have here? Oh, damn it. I was actually at the, yeah, <laughs> too many things. I was at the Matrix booth. I presented Fluffy Chat to Matrix guys. Huh? They were completely uh, hyping it. Yeah? They said Fluffy Chat is um, the cutest and, and nicest uh, client they have now seen on a mobile phone so far. Um, and um, they were absolutely happy that we, that we dropped by. So a big shout out again for Krille, our community member who did Fluffy Chat. He was able to impress even the Matrix guys there. It was very nice. Yeah. And um, besides the Matrix booth, uh, there was also uh, XMPP guys. I don't know exactly from which organization or was it XMPP themselves. Anyway, I talked with those guys about if there is an option for a Jabber or XMPP client and cooperation again, or somebody from their team that would be interested in working out a nice uh, XMPP client for the phone. Also some feature that people have requested over the last two years. Um, they also just collected my card in this case. I didn't have, I don't have any of those, I think. And we will see what comes out. I mean, normally after those trade uh, or trade fairs and so on, you need considerable amount of time to go through all the contacts that you have collected and ping them again or come back. So I hope that was not um, the first and the last time that I had contact with them. So we'll see. Um, and last but not least, this is one of the more important things, uh, the guys from Network Manager. Um, the Network Manager currently on the phone um, kind of works. Uh, it's a little bit slow on transitioning between Wi-Fi and network and back to Wi-Fi. Uh, you and we know all these things like losing sometimes a Wi-Fi password or for some reason the Wi-Fi won't reconnect. There are small, small glitches with that. Huh? And uh, the, luckily then the guy that got in contact with me already before Fosten. We made specifically an appointment for that uh, for the Saturday. And then it had to shift it to Sunday because on Saturday I just didn't reach him. Um, he already has a Nexus 4 and uh, he's very interested that Network Manager continues to be used by us as the central place for the managing the network connections because even they are not related to Ubuntu or to Canonical, they are working for KDE. Yeah? Uh, they still think that it was awesome that Network Manager got upgraded for mobile connections and with the Ophono stuff and so on. And he organized himself a Nexus 4 that he can really work on a phone and test new versions of Network Manager. So what we want to have here is that we have a really um, nice reactive um, connection manager that uh, has also support for captive portals and all this stuff that makes our life easier. Uh, so. Don't stand somewhere and wait for the signal and turn around your phone and then suddenly, oh, now I have internet. Oh, I don't. Yeah? Those things. Yeah? So uh, I really hope that this will be uh, a nice cooperation and there I see the most chances that we that we get something in short time, yeah? uh, which basically means we can use the upstream network manager um, as far as possible with the latest version and not have to wait for any distribution update. And the one in 16.04, it's quite okay, as I said in the beginning, but the latest one has a lot of more improvements. Yeah. And it will also be IPv6 and um, I don't know, automatic detection of the Wi-Fi encryption. I don't know if anybody noticed, but if you open up an Android phone, for example, and you connect to a hotspot, it will suggest the encryption type because it just detects it properly. And you just have to input your password or your credentials for the enterprise uh, VPA and so on. But on Ubuntu Touch, it's more or less always suggesting that you have um, VPA2 or something like this. And even if you have to change a lot of parameters, you can make mistakes. Yeah? With yeah. simple networks, it's not that, that much an issue, but automatic detection of the correct encryption type and setup of that would be great. Yeah? Mm -hmm. 
and all these somehow circles around the network manager and i hope i can convince those guys they are based in czech republic um i convince can convince them to work with us for a better future of that Poor. and then i ate belgian waffles and i can really recommend to everyone who comes to brussels or to belgium those. Leak through the waffles. They were so great. Yeah. And then we talked, we, we listened to a few talks. For example, the Matrix talk was very interesting. How the French government tries to um, de deploy Matrix as a secure messenger for public affairs uh, or for government affairs. Um, that's something interesting because it's an open technology that would be uh, used by a government or a state. It doesn't happen that often. Uh, so it was a great talk, how they managed to get the matrix standard to the latest version, how they are going to handle this in the future, and how they interacted with the French government to make it an even more secure thing. Uh, um, yeah. Um, what else? Mm, we had great, great evening activities, of course. Uh, sorry for everybody who stayed at home, but besides the waffles, also the Belgian beer is very nice. Uh, uh, some of the flavors are a little bit, ooh, what is this? But in general, Belgian beer is okay. Yeah? Waffles and, was the best. <laughs> <laughs> the waffle was the best. The waffle was more or less the best. Yeah, you have they have toppings on top. You cannot imagine those oh. toppings they put on waffles. So. Yeah, okay. it's um, it's like a little like a full lunch or dinner with uh, calorie in terms of calories. Yeah, this waffle was cute. Yes. <laughs> more sugar than I need in a year. So that's sure. yes. Yeah, okay, that's basically my impression from Forstem. I can really recommend and I hope really that we can make a presence of uh, UV ports and Ubuntu Touch on Forstem one day uh, because it would be so cool to have a booth there and so many people stepping by and seeing what we do and to talk with them. And I did not mention, and this might be picked up by both of you guys because you spend considerable more time with, uh, for example, the, the booth with the, with the Pine guys and so on. But there were a lot of hardware uh, things there that you could see. And um, yeah, it was just great yeah? and totally overcrowded. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah. I, I think my, my biggest thing to come to Faustin was also to meet Dalton for the first time. Uh, oh, yes, sure. Hello, Dalton. We met the first time. Yeah. 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 I had never seen these people in person ever. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I can now confirm Dalton is real. Yes. yes, not yes. a robot, not an AI. Not a... This is not deep face. He has been he has been in a taxi with me, and I can confirm. <laughs> yep. True, uh... Let's yep. not go into that one. <laughs> nope. But um, should I continue go my for journey? It. Yeah. So, so my journey on on Faustem was um, I was mostly with 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 Dalton and Nikita, not kid from my community. Uh, it was kind of this gang going together, uh, this false them. Um, <laughs> but it was really nice. Um, we got to, as, as Florian said, we was a lot with the, the Pine guys. We got to to meet the Pine and the Pine community, the people around, software around Pine, uh, the Manjaro community, Arch Manjaro, uh, not Arch Manjaro, um, Manjaro. Arm, just, just Manjaro. Arm, Arm Manjaro. Uh, which is based on Arch. Um, we also got to meet the KD guys, uh, Bushan from KD, Rowan from KD, and uh, lots of other people from KD, which was really nice to meet them. Um, we also got to meet with um, um, Ayatana Indicator, which is our indicator. I got to talk with him, some Debian guys, a lot of Debian guys. <laughs> um, Debian was everywhere. Deb Debian, both Debian is everywhere, and Debian people was everywhere so i guess that holds true <laughs> um but yeah we also got to to socialize which is uh, probably the biggest thing with, with fastem to to talk with with the people that you work with um to to basically also talk a lot of the future what we should do next um what's our next steps um and if you are one of the people that's really looking at the, the screen right now you can see some of the progress that we have been doing the last uh, the particularly eagle-eyed viewers yeah the particular eagle-eyed viewers you can see it um something is running um <laughs> <laughs> but anyway yeah. yeah we also got to attend to uh the purism talk um 
we had other talks we were uh, attending to, um, but most instantly, interestingly, was the the pre-roasting talk, which was really nice to attend to. Um, so yeah, I uh, think it was good. Yeah, and we also got to meet uh, Nakuno OS, uh, which was also really nice to to meet up with those, and and maybe something comes out from that later on. Mm-hmm. Well, I had a great time too. I was the earliest arrival at Fosnum. Oh, yeah. I was there at 6.30 a.m. Mm-hmm. And I got off the plane and as we we went through all of the like ent- uh, arrivals like out of the straight out of the gate and I see people with their laptops like this. <laughs> like I walked over to them and said, is this the Fosdem crew? <laughs> they said, yep, we're here. So that was actually the Mozilla guys. And, you know, we went through customs together and I talked with them and they talked about some really ridiculously old hardware that I don't know why anyone would want, but uh, it sounded pretty cool. Uh, and then after th- then they left and I sat in Brussels airport alone for a little while. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the KDE guys arrived next, so I did have someone to talk to for a little bit. And then Marius arrived, and we uh, caught a train and got out of there. Mm-hmm. Um, so this was Friday, about 8 a.m. on Friday already. And the first thing we did was walk around central Brussels and have waffles and find a really good small Italian restaurant that was oh. good. But don't forget the guy with the waffles, though. That little waffle place. Little waffle shop. Yep. Ooh, so good. I think that's where uh, you don't hear the story of Fosdem from other, you know, podcasts or stories or anything is just, you know, both the fringe of before and after, but also meeting all the people who you're going to Fosdem with. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because the first thing that I did with the people who I've worked with for two years now was walk around central Brussels with them. Yeah. It's true. As soon as I met them in person, and that was awesome. So, thank you guys. Um, but you want to hear about the actual event. So, Saturday morning, we got up nice and late. Oh, right. <laughs> Actually, really late. Um, and noticed it was snowing, sleeting, raining, terrible things outside. It was 30 degrees and trying to snow. And we decided, you know what? We're going to walk. So 40 minutes of terrible, wet, slushy, it was 40, uh, walk later, we arrive at ULB, and we vowed we were not going to walk to Fosdem ever again if we stayed at that hotel. (laughs) The interesting thing, the next day was really sunny, really nice day, we took an Uber. Yep, yep, didn't (laughs) actually walk that day. Maybe I should mention that I was queuing for a ticket on the tram station and there were so many people and they were so slow with this ticket machine that I looked on the next arrival, two minutes, the next train, and then 17 minutes. I said, I will not wait another 15 minutes for the next train. And then everybody got inside this tram and it was so many people that I also went inside without a ticket and I said, come on, nobody can check my ticket. Nobody can move. So... um, (laughs) I just let the doors close behind me and said, okay, um, for, the, <laughs> for, the, for the sake of the open source community, I will just risk a ticket. And of course, nobody checked it. Yeah, So I'm, I'm confessed to be uh, very, very naughty with that. Yeah? But it was impossible to get a ticket on this machine because 50 other people were trying the same. Yeah? And at least 25 of them also went on board without a ticket. I think. Those <laughs> machines were really hard to use, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, yes. so slow too. But we, we actually took... An Uber because it was cheaper for us since we have more people. It yeah, kind of, it was. It was kind of sad to know that it's cheaper to take an Uber, but yeah, it was. Well, well, it wasn't cheaper if we actually did as Florian did, but we are. <laughs> <laughs> no, Florian got it the cheapest. <laughs> we are upstanding citizens. Here's the proof. I still bought some tickets. It's not that I did it on on purpose every time. Yeah. So here are my my remaining tickets from the remaining drives. Yeah? Good work. Good work. You're a law abiding citizen. Oh boy. What else? Uh, once the first thing we did when we got to Fosdem 
was go to the Pine 64 booth and play with their hardware. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, we did not go to the initial talk. We went straight to their booth. <laughs> Uh, and we got to get hands on with all of their awesome new hardware, like that tablet and the Pinebook Pro, and it's all really awesome. The Manjaro guys were there to work on the um, uh, Pinebook, the old one, or the standard one, or the one that currently exists. There we go. Yeah. Um. Uh, that was the day we went to the Matrix talk, um, and it was just a day full of just mostly meeting people for me. I didn't really go to Fosdem with a big plan in mind of what I was going to do or what my schedule of talks was, because as far as I knew before I got there, there was no way to get into the rooms anyway. And that's completely correct. Yep. So much. people. Yep. There's a lot of people there. It's hard to get to the booths that you want to get to either. I tried, I tried to get into this one talk, um, about the, the bootloader stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, I thought maybe 45 minutes before I would be there, but then somebody wanted to meet me and I got delayed. And then when I came there, the room was full and the talk didn't even start. And mm -hmm. there were other people waiting for spare places if maybe somebody moved them out. And we completely gave up on this, on the smaller developer rooms. And so it's really, I was thinking why so many people are interested in just and an an arm bootloader, but it seems you like cool. it's Excuse yes, you. I know, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that other people also know this. Yeah, um, okay, but it was yeah. still great, even if in the, if we if we didn't see, let's say, all maybe only ten percent of the talks we could have visited. Yeah, but it was still cool. Yeah. I mean, for the for the purism talk, Mario sat between me and another person on two chairs. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, we cheated on that one. Yeah, we there were perfectly normal. Chairs, yeah. Nothing to see here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got so many looks when I actually just tried to jump into that because I struggled a little bit. I'm like, ah, <laughs> you were gonna break their table. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the best was that Marius was then live fixing the phone. Um, oh, uh, was it Diogo's phone, right? Yeah, Diogo's Diogo brought phone. a Pro Five that had a bum USB port, so Marius fixed it. <laughs> And he started replacing a USB port with a spare part and a lot of credit cards to actually get the, the battery, battery out. Yeah? And it looked like eventually everything would break in a second, either the cards or the battery or both. Yeah? But he managed to do it. Yeah? So I, it was really interesting. Yeah? Do I have to say there was a lot of people around us at that point, like just looking mm -hmm. at them, like <laughs> yes. answering. They were all going down with us that battery exploded. <laughs> Yeah, if that that's the thing, it's a lit lithium-ion battery, and it probably shouldn't do it with so many people. But if that had been burning, <laughs> that would be a catastrophic thing. <laughs> oh no! But yeah, it, it was after the talk period. We didn't do it while the periods and talk. No, we weren't doing it while they were talking. No, no, no. But but actually, about the periods and talk, we actually got also to to ask a lot of questions about why use GTK and all this. So I I think we we got got out of that some talk was pretty good. So. Mm -hmm. Other cool things. I got a haiku CD. Oh God! Physical media. This is this is the coolest thing I got at Fo at Fosdem. Like, not even lying. Um, the coolest thing I got at Fosdem was a Debian T-shirt. <laughs> is that what it says on it? Yeah, it's just a Debian logo. Oh, okay. No, I thought no, that no, no. Said... I, I got one from a free software foundation also, which was really good. Uh huh. Uh, God, that, oh my gosh, that building was packed. The K building. K building. You couldn't walk in there. No, but there was so much cool stuff, like Plasma Mobile running on a Risk Five board. That was also cool. Was it mobile? Wasn't it just a normal yeah, it was plasma? plasma mobile? Oh, well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I thought it was a normal Plasma when I was Oop. there. Huh. I think you're blind, but... I might <laughs> be. Or it might be about a different time, so it might actually have been Plasma. Mm-hmm. So that is Fosdem. And if you want to hear more, just ask us. Um, we should probably move on now, seeing as yes. how we're quite a few minutes in. But um, if you want to hear more about Fosdem, if you want us to advertise to you more, uh, you should totally go to Fosdem. By the way, go to Fosdem. Uh, <laughs> just let Get us know. Waffle. Only, just go for the waffles. If you don't I mean, want to see Fosdem, you, it's worth it. The waffles wa are worth waffles it. Them. Waffles them. <laughs> Waffles them. Yeah. 
Okay, let's get serious here. Let's get to the serious corner. Yes. All right, that's the best segue I can do. Um, yesterday, I posted a post on the Ubiports forum about uh, the OTA 8 upgrade, which is getting about time to roll out soon. Um, basically, we're having some problems, and what we originally thought we would be able to do in this update won't be able to come to fruition. So our original plan was to bring an update to both Unity 8 and Mir. Mir to 1.1 1 .1 and Unity 8 to whatever the last version was before Canonical dropped the project. I forget what the version numbering on Unity was. Um, so that is posted in the forum. Let's put that in live chat so people can look at it. But the more important part why I wanted to mention this now um, is that those changes that aren't working quite right and the issues are described in that post will also affect edge channels starting tomorrow or Monday because we're going to merge all that work into the edge channel so we can work on it and get more testers. Um, so anyone who's on the edge channel, watch out for that. If you have a device with Qualcomm hardware, you will be seeing graphical glitches, um, apps failing to start, a lot of not very fun things starting tomorrow or Monday in Edge. So with that, we won't be able to ship that Unity 8 or a mere upgrade in OTA 8, but we will be shipping OTA 8 pretty soon. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change gears. We're going to be merging a few more PRs that are open right now, and then we'll move to testing and then release. Yep. Uh, meanwhile, Marius has free reign to do absolutely nothing except work on Mir, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. The the <laughs> thing with Mir is um, it's not really Mir's fault. It's more uh, no. Qualcomm and because of binary <laughs> blobs and stuff. Yes, blame Qualcomm. Uh, well, yeah, basically you can't blame Qualcomm because they didn't open source it. So we don't know what's going on under a hood. That's the problem. Throwing some shade. Yeah. Well, it's true. It's if it if it was open source, it would be much easier to debug. But mm. now we are kind of blind, just looking at some API calls, and that's it. Right. So even with this initial work, if you are using the Edge channel, you will find that um, there are a lot of improvements to both Mir and Unity Eight in these new versions. So the um, Mir has got or, <sighs> Unity Eight in general is a lot snappier. Um, minus the performance issues on Qualcomm hardware, you can tell that they put a lot of work into reducing input lag right before they dropped the project, you know, around that point. Yes. They were getting really close to some really big fixes and really big improvements to things like that. So once we get that all merged in, it will be a much better experience. However, of course, as we've been saying for months and months now, it will remove scopes from the image. There will be no more scopes after that point. Mm -hmm. And I did see a question earlier, will scopes be coming back? Not in their current form. Um, what, we what we will do is explore solutions that uh, replace scopes in a better, more sane, not making a completely um, new app development model way. Whew. And again, that is in the Ubiports forum in the OS section. It's posted in the live chat. Uh, if you want to find that information, reply, ask questions, anything like that. Mm -hmm. Whew. All right, bottom of the hour. I think it's about time that we thank our sponsors. So thank you, everyone, who's been supporting us on, oh, so many platforms, uh, Patreon, PayPal, LibraPay, uh, I saw we got a little bit of Bitcoin earlier in the month, so people are still rocking the Bitcoin. Good work. You are uh, carrying the torch when no one else wants to. It will come back. It won't come back. You said that last time, too. And then it didn't come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, it did. <laughs> if you would like to join any of those people, you can find those links at ubports.com slash donate for all those handy links and the Bitcoin address, which I am legally required to say. Otherwise, Marius will fire me. 
<laughs> oh. A special thanks know. to our sponsors, uh, including Smooze, which I found out is not uh, Dutch, but rather Swiss. That is an important distinction. Uh, private internet access, DigitalOcean, and Packet.net. Thank you all for your help with our infrastructure and just general community um, events, everything in that space. All of your support is extremely helpful. And maybe we also should mention one time GitLab. They also support us, not really with a financial donation, um, but um, as we are uh, moving things over there, uh, we can see that we really benefit from our gold status there, right? Uh, mm -hmm. for having all the features that we need to layer and structure um, our code base, our for uh, not forms, our trackers and stuff there. And GitLab also uh, donates, let's say, us all the, the CPU time for making builds on their servers for the apps. And more and more core apps are being built by GitLab automatically, and we don't have to pay for that. Yeah? Yeah. So while they don't really actively are our sponsor, we just participate in their program, and I would say, Thank you, GitLab, for that, uh, because it's making things much easier for the app developers now that we can really have a CI pipeline, continuous integration, continuous development pipeline for that, not only also, for the core US. We also did talk to some uh, some of the guys from, from GitLab at FastTime, too. So that was nice. Yes, that was incredibly useful, because yeah. I asked them, like, how do they do their dev packaging so that it actually gets sent into a Debian repository? Because the way we're doing that right now on Jenkins is admittedly a little hacky, but it works. And we haven't really figured that out on GitLab yet. So they gave us a lot of pointers and a repository we can go to that has all the code they used to do that. So that was super helpful. Yep. And also one thing I forgot to, to mention, uh, we also got to, make, um, to meet up with the Postmarket OS guys, which was really Post nice. Market. Yep. Yes. And also... You got some interesting insights on to bring in Unity 8 there and some tips and tricks. And that was nice. Explosions. Explosions. And we meet Ellen Pope from Canonical. Ah, that yes. yes. Very, very awesome. And to... a ton of community members. Yeah. We cannot even mention all of them. Um, so everybody yeah. who we met, thank you for meeting you. <laughs> <sighs> okay, Fostem really impressed us a lot, as you can see, because we are constantly returning to that topic to add one or two more sentences. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it's clear it was a, a huge event for us, and the um, waffle really does something with your brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, psycho sugar. waffles. Yeah. You're addicted <laughs> to waffles. <laughs> I can't make them here, though. So. Mm. No, that it's real. They're really hard to make. Actually, don't do it with any like normal waffle iron. You will destroy the waffle iron. <laughs> Okay, let's get back to question and away from Boston. Yeah, let's take some questions. So we take these questions from the forum and occasionally live chat via Telegram or YouTube chat. If you want to have a better chance of getting them live, though, the forum is the best place for you. That's at forums.ubiports.com. And we don't have a complete guarantee that we will get to all of your questions. At this point, we are rather far in the hour to be starting these, but we will go from the top here. Or not from the top, it's actually a bit of a shuffle. I do things weird. Blame me. If you're ever upset about how we choose questions, just yell at me. It's the best choice. You have a good discussion. Feedback to MarioSecretyPorts.com. Um, just get upset questions. in general. Blame Dalton. <laughs> so our first question comes from Tiger Pro this week. Should we be attending shows like Fosdom as vendors rather than guests? Yes. Yeah. To yep. Totally. Yep. So, so this year we we didn't apply for for a booth. Uh, we did, however, though, apply for trying to get a, a talk, but we didn't get accepted. Probably because there's so much, so much. Um, but hopefully next year we can apply as vendors or more as a project. Um, would be really nice to to show off our our phones and our Unity eight. Mm -hmm. Because in all the talks with the people there, you could figure out that they don't know, uh, not many of the people there know that uh, Ubuntu Touch is still a thing or there is even something project like this. Uh, so it's 
also necessary for our communication and for our marketing that we have a presence on the on the bigger shows uh, or the bigger bigger project things like Forstem and um, of course Ubucon for example uh, and a few maybe in Germany that I know would be very important that we have a continuous presence there. Uh, I mean, Forstem will not guarantee this for us, but we will try to apply by time. And um, I think it should be possible. There are, there are so many small booths that uh, they should have some space for us. Uh, even maybe it's only for two people uh, or even one, because they can be very, very uh, slim. Uh, then you have only space for one guy standing behind the table and one one big flip chart thingy size, um, uh, I don't know, informational paper or so. But well, that's where possible, we put yeah. the TV. That's where we put the TV and just have the hardware run on yes. it. Perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so Tiger Pro, yes, we will try to go to force them next year as a vendor or as a project. Well, and we did actually, we did actually not to totally go as guests. We actually got to show off our work at the fine pine booth. Yeah. Yes, we hijacked it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of communities hijacked it. They didn't seem to mind too much. Yeah. Let's yeah. and that brings us exactly to the next question. If it we does have bring us to the next question from oh, nice. L Fortinet, do you have any contact with Pine64 on the Pine phone? Oh, yes, Very I much. think we have a contact. I think we have a small amount <laughs> of contact with them. Not anymore. <laughs> a wonderful device. Uh, this is the first dev kit of not anymore. <laughs> Of the uh, Pine Phone, the next dev kits are currently in progress and will be coming. Maybe, you know, maybe I Mario should. Tablet. Yeah, maybe well, Mario showed a working one. This is actually running Unity eight and has. Yeah, that one's actually running Unity eight. Mm -hmm. um... <laughs> See, Neil, it runs the Edge image, uh, the newest Edge image, and it runs a newer mirror that we are gonna merge into Edge. So it's actually the same version as we run on on phones. Eventually. So, yeah. Big oof. Thanks, YouTube live chat. <laughs> <laughs> so they Mario's never side with went, <laughs> They both went to the booth and they just started flashing the Pine64 prototype there. I mean, kind of a uh, life hacking at the Pine64 booth. Very nice. Mm -hmm, 100%. You need some big pockets for that. That is completely correct. This is the first edition. All of their hardware will have this will, is based around the same stuff. So the uh, uh, A64, so that's their tablet, the Pinebook, the phone, um, basically everything. So we should have not too much trouble getting between all the different devices. Yep. And I am particularly interested in seeing all of those dev kits as they come, not only for the phone, but also for that tablet, because I found that tablet really, really cool. And also, they are they're actually shipping shipping those out to developers pretty quick. If you saw pretty the, quick, yeah. If you saw the the post that they did on the Pine forum, you can actually see mm -hmm. a picture of, of them and and see the more more details. I told the person who writes those posts, you need like a proper blog because this forum just isn't doing you justice. You need you need to be able to get this word out wide because this is great. Yes, well, I did get out wide with uh, with some uh, blogging from people. Mm -hmm. so. Yup. Okay, so that's Pine64. Uh, he had another question. Are there any updates on the Librem 5? Yes. And we also in, in still in contact with, uh, with those. And now after we have the chat with them at, uh, uh, at Fostem, um, we actually got now contacts and yes, they are sending out uh, the dev kits. Uh, so I'm really excited to to get those and get the same version we are running here and to show it off. Uh, so maybe next Q and A we we already got it. Um, that seems a little accelerated to me. Oh, you mean well, we already got the hardware? Okay, yeah. Hardware. Yeah, well, that probably sense. already probably already running since they already have um, running with with others and our stack is not uh, too much different from from the 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 one that uh, Katie are running on it already. Um, okay. So. So maybe next time we, we actually can show that off in a similar way as we show this. Um, but yeah. the thing is, um, uh, they, they said that they have a limited amount of those kits. Uh, so 
that's why it's taken a little bit longer with them. Yep. And they've had a little bit of trouble with the hardware in some of them. So we totally yep. understand what's going on there. Um, hardware is hard. Hardware is very hard. Um, software with it is a little harder, but we can take on some challenges. Software is hard too. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Up next. Uh, Does Rudy. Oh. Oh, what? No, I, I just want to quickly, while we are on the, the topic, um, when said, the, does the does the dev keeper have a working screen? Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. It should. But this, this, the was one of the, this was one of the issues that they, they had while they are a little bit delayed too. So. Yeah. Maybe we should move up one question here because uh, that's also regarding PinePhone and Librem 5. Uh, and yeah. uh, we can group it a little bit better. So we have a topic of questions now. Um, so Trenilleur wants to know, that's French, Trenilleur, my French is not so good, good but work. hopefully it's right. What changes for UT on the PinePhone Libre 5? What he means by that is what changes do we need to do on our stack of um, OS middleware and uh, low level and so on that we can actually run Ubuntu Touch on those hardware? So the changes uh, are actually pretty minimal. Um, the thing that, that that really requires a, a redesign is the the mirror on mirror stuff, um, which basically where we can run a mirror server on top of a mirror server, um, and also mirror clients in that way. Um, this is something we can't do because we are using proprietary software for uh, not proprietary software, proprietary the graphics driver graphics drivers, which is the Mali graphics drivers. And um, yep, uh, just a second here. So the big, yeah, that's the big problem with um, some of the dev kits we're getting in now is we're using those proprietary drivers that don't support all of that good stuff that we need that works on the phone to allow Unity 8 to provide the login screen and the session and the loading screen before the session, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. That's going to be... But that's the, and, but that's the, um, the mirror stuff. Um, Canonical has actually designed it pretty neatly. Yeah. So the only there's yeah. only one package that's supposed to have all that configuration in it, and we're getting closer to actually getting that to be the case now. So yeah. Well, it was it, really close from Canonical, so they have yeah. done good. In the end, the only difference between the two images should be the Android image has LXC Android config installed, and the non-Android one doesn't. Exactly, and it also has some um, some hyper stuff, which uh, the other does not. Right, which is pulled in by yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the changes. Now Rudy asked, <laughs> "What is the status of Anbox right now?" Ooh, yeah. This is this is the thing that we have. Um, Anbox is a is a bit of a a beast to mm -hmm. to work with. Um, and since we have so many other projects going at the same time, it has been put a little bit on on ice um, for good reasons. And the, the the mind of the major reason is we need a proper base and we need a proper upgrade all the more important parts like Unity 8 and all that that's underneath it before we work on the top the things that goes on the top. Um, so sure, it would work. Uh, currently on the current work, work in Unity 8, um, but there's more um, important parts like Holium and all these that that really is required for for Anbox to actually work on them because more phones you can actually have more support for for Anbox, more developers to Anbox, um, and and um, and it also has a lot to do with time um, since at that point it was mostly me that worked on it. Um, and my time is is used elsewhere, and that's why it's it's. Mm -hmm. uh, and on of, also one of the major reasons why I was starting so early was in the hopes that other developers would take over, maybe get interested in in uh, in Unbox and maybe continue it a little bit. Um, but sadly, it didn't happen that much uh, as we hoped. Um, but we definitely want to to get back to it. Um, but Unity eight upgrade and a mere upgrade which is essential for our operating system um, is what we focus on first. Um, and then once that's done, we can actually focus on, on Anbox and make all the, the cool stuff we want to see. So I, I like to see it in, in this way. 
uh, you first work on the stuff that you don't see. Uh, so we started with upgrading to senior and all these things that you don't really notice. Uh, and then we're getting closer and closer to things that you actually see. Um, so yep. easy told. Yeah. Um, right now, Anbox kind of hard depends on us upgrading Mir. So that is a yeah. hard dependency. Because before we do that, when we do that, we're likely to break everything. And we don't want to fix everything, then break everything, then fix it again. So yeah. That's and also a hard critical with, path type thing right now. It also has a lot to do with performance too. Uh, yeah. With Mir actually being a lot more performant. We get more performance out of, of Anbox. Um, yeah. Battery performance is a problem too, as people have noticed who have tested it. Yeah. Yep. Anbox is coming. It's, um, it's just that it's slow. It, it's hard. It, it, it's <laughs> a big project. It, it's a really big project. Mm -hmm. Which is unfortunate, but we'll get there. Just not now. Yeah. Lionel asked, I'm on the Devil channel. How can I know what the changes are between updates to eventually test or correctly report bugs? Yeah, so this is a bit of a pain point for people because we don't currently ship change logs to every devil image inside the devil image. The best way right now to figure out if anything has changed is to be watching the GitHub repositories because anything that's been changed recently will appear at the top of the list. So that's a pretty good judge of what's been changed recently. Um, Anything that gets merged into any Xenial branch in the organization is in the image or in the next image on the next day, whenever that happens. So if you're watching that, then that is the, the place to be as far as I'm concerned. Otherwise, just normally using your phone will probably bring up any issues that you'll find. So keep doing that and you'll probably find most of the issues. One of the things that, that will change in, in a later stage is once we move to a different infrastructure, we actually have built-in support for automatically creating changelog based on the Debian changelog files. Uh, okay. So this, this will be really interesting to see if we actually use this actively in, in a newer infrastructure. Because right now, it's impossible to do that automatically. We have to have someone to do it manually, and that's not going to happen every day. Right. Oh, one other thing I remember. Um, in the organization, we have a project for each release. So we had one for OTA 7, now we have one for OTA 8. Whenever we merge something or fix an issue, we should, assuming everyone is following the process, have the issue listed on that board under the QA column. Yes, yes. So that, I remember now, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the thing, the thing with it that I see is that people don't necessarily know when it's in the image because it might take a day or two before it actually lands in the image. And then when you have skipped some updates, you don't really know what's in this or what's not. So I understand it's hard to, to follow. Um, but if you, as Dalton say, if you, if you follow the milestone, uh, you can get a, a pretty good idea of what's in. Or you can wait to the next table and you get a, a pretty change log. Yeah. Okay. Michelle has a bit of a question to unpack here, which is a little bit of fun. Right now, app development is trending towards using Qt Quick Controls 2 from Qt with the Saru style applied. However, Qt Quick Controls 2 doesn't have all of the components that the Ubuntu UI toolkit has. And that would be the big project that Canonical made to make convergent apps. Rodney's project Ergo isn't ready quite yet. So what should we do about this situation? This now, is there was... a really interesting one, but I would take really quick because I, yep. I see the the Telring guys, uh, Florian and, and co, has done really nicely on exactly this topic where they try to use as much Qt quick, quick controls and then integrate um, you. UI to Kilt as necessary, and it seems to work really nice. Maybe Florian has some more on that topic. Um, I think that uh, Michele is asking this question because he's also working on teleports a bit, and he ah. is mainly doing UI work there. So, um, of course, we started off with the idea also by, from Dan Chapman that we move everything to Qt Quick Controls 2. But we quickly figured out it's not so easy because 
for example, the keyboard would not uh, fly in when you click on an input box with the QT Quick controls. Um, we had um, some other strange layout issues and the page stack was not working as expected in some things and so on. So we really started to mix it and um, it seems to work. Uh, and yeah, why not? It's just about um, you don't have just one library of controls. But anyways, today uh, everybody works with, uh, with a range of uh, different uh, imports in QML. They don't need to come all from the same place. And um, the only question that I would raise in here is if we are able to uh, make a transition in some way, um, if we really can take all the functionality from the old UI tool toolkit to somewhere else. Uh, and um, we see a few efforts, like, uh, for example, when Rodney is doing his project here um, to make uh, something that is similar to a UI toolkit that we have already. Um, we should put some effort at a certain uh, point into that. But I would uh, expect that this is a community project thing, like uh, the core team at the moment cannot just uh, work on, on the upgrading the toolkit or the quick controls too. Um, but it would be a nice uh, project for anybody who wants to help us here uh, with uh, forming up a team of people maybe working on that. Yeah. Because the advantage will be that the new controls are much faster and uh, much better organized, let's say, and um, they are up to date. They are um, in the in the latest packages from for Qt. Um, that's maintained more or less. Yeah. Our toolkit will not be maintained at the, or is not maintained at the moment, and probably will also not be maintained in the future like that. Yeah. Right. So of course we have a, a huge benefit if we take something that's already existing and maintained by some upstream guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. of course, the phone needs a few special things that are not possible with the standard controls. And um, yeah, that's also theming, for example, the notorious night mode and all this stuff. Uh, they, have, they have had some problems with that. Yeah. But we have to, there is an interesting thing is that um, QT Quick Controls is, is still in, in very early mode, uh, especially the Zero Team. The Zero Team was, was made by Stefano. Uh, which is not actively in the community uh, so much anymore, um, but um, it still could require a lot of more work and a lot of these issues could actually be fixed in this um, since it has a, a pretty good template templating system uh, in Qt Quick Controls. So it, it, it's not to say that Qt Quick Controls is, is, um, is not the final option, but the, the Qt Quick Controls could actually be improved with the Zero Team. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the other project is Rodney's Ergo. Ergo, mm -hmm. Ergo. <laughs> I think it's all of those, um, which is supposed to be a toolkit and a HIG human interface guideline set or you know set of design patterns that you would use to create convergent apps. It isn't supposed to be locked to Ubuntu Touch. It isn't supposed to be locked to Linux even. It's supposed to run everywhere. It will, if it's completed, it will probably replace the UITK entirely. That won't be for a while, but yeah, that's totally going to happen if that's what's completed. Yeah. But we won't remove any, any APIs though, so. No, we wouldn't just remove the Ubuntu components before it's their time to be removed. Yeah. But that won't happen anytime soon, so. Yep. Don't worry if you're an app developer, you can still actually base your app on UI to TK and it. Yeah. Be for right now, you can still use the UI TK, use as much cute con use as much from the cute quick control set as you can, because that'll be more maintainable, a little bit better on other uh, platforms or porting or anything like that. But you can mix the UI TK into your apps and that's okay. We aren't going. Not, we aren't going to hurt you for it. Also, a, a good thing is also performance. Um, yeah. The new Qt Quick Control is a lot better optimized than the old one. So. Yep, a lot faster than the UITK. So. Which UITK is based on Qt Quick Controls one. So. From Qt five dot three days. Probably. So they're a little now. rough. Okay, let's move on. Mm-hmm. 
Ali Sachs asked, Is the Holium 7.1 build for the Fairphone 2 that was done during the live porting session available for testing? No. Not right well, now, at least. Technically, you could build it yourself from yeah. the live stream. So, depends what you mean. It's not. It, it doesn't have any... Uh, images or anything like that, but you can follow the stream exactly and actually get a copy of it. Yeah, um, it's not ready for anyone to test it on their phone, for one thing. But one thing I have to say, sim, sim is actually working. <laughs> yes, but you... during the live stream, we didn't have the radio working. But then Marius sent me a picture after it of his sim card in the slot backwards, and it was like, I figured yes. out why radio didn't work. <laughs> I flipped it around and the radio just worked. So, <laughs> oh my god. It was a good time. We should have ended that stream at two hours, but it was still fun. <laughs> yes. But Actually, the thing is, just, yeah. we will get back to, to the porting, live porting again, again, and we will use the, the, so. the Fairphone 2 as our continuing device to, to show off how we do the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And let let me make a two a two sentence advertisement for for porting um, uh, overall because uh, our documentation has made uh, quite a, a good step forward, and um, for for reference and for checking the documentation, I again started to port for my Samsung S3, and um, I was much faster this time than last year. So our porting documents on Halium dot org, com org. Um, is it org, right? Halium.org. Yes, yep. uh, docshalium.org and also docsuviports.com uh, is mentioning uh, steps for porting. The documentation got really improved and a lot of people are now much more successful with getting to a state where the device boots uh, into either the reference uh, root file system or even our uh, uviports file system already. Of course, hardware will not work that much out of the box, but it's much easier to get to a working screen and actually, you can see something then, and you can start interacting with the phone in a normal way, not just having to do everything via console. Yeah, I, I think one of the, the things that we actually did really good on is the, the porting FIQ, uh, which was a real success. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the common errors stuff in the documentation yes. where people yep. are contributing fixes to their errors that they're finding during porting, that's really nice. And yes. also the setup of the of the manifest things and what comes out and the Halium tools that are there now in place for automatically setting up certain things is really great. Uh, it saves a lot of time. It's all gone pretty great, actually. Mm -hmm. Can we end with that? <laughs> <laughs> also to mention that there are 500 people in the Halium group, more than 500 people. Uh, if you compare the supergroup, which is around 2,000 people, so 25% of the supergroup users are more or less interested in porting, and that's also great. Yeah. There are also people from other operating systems, of course. Yeah, true. Um, yes, I would say we have now this last question here would be a wonderful last question of the QA. You remember the tradition that we have had one last question that was either totally awesome or totally strange. And I think that's really in the middle of it. Maybe even Marius yeah. cannot answer it. Let's see. Right. Let's, Let's give it a try, try it. So the question is about is GL GLVND <laughs> between the app and LibHybris GL plant would make shipping one root available for both Mesa and Hybris devices easier. Yes, this is not something we have actively actively talked about or even actively researched. But what he's talking about Sounds is, good. yeah, it's the um, the venue neutral lib library from Nvidia, which is supposed to to standardize a way that you don't need to to set your LD config and and all these things that you need to do to select the right EGL libraries and EDL and all these uh, other extension that he uses. Um, so this is a good example on that device, which uses the Mesa EGL implementation, which means that on that device, you need to set DL config to actually use uh, the binary that comes with Mesa. Uh, no, not with, not with Mesa, with, with Mali. Mali yeah. um, on, on desktop, you have Mesa, which means that you need to set your DL configs to, to use Mesa. Uh, and and then um, on Android, everything is terrible. On Android, we don't currently do this. We don't have a GL implementation the same way. Uh, there was something that Canonical worked on on Mirror 20, 
0.26, 0 0.26, but then we don't use it. So we kind of omit that whole glib and uh, using the initialization actually going on in uh, lib hybrid. So we don't actually do that. We go to mirror and mirror does it that way. Um, but there was a plan to actually do it this way. Um, but yes, it would be interesting to use that library, um, but it's not something we, we actively think about because the DL does actually work pretty nicely. Um, but yes, it would be nice not thinking about it too much. Okay, if you only understood 50% of that answer, then you're already a, a great developer. <laughs> um, but I it's, certainly it's, learned something today. Yeah, but I think it's good also that uh, we really have uh, people in the community. And actually, this is a shout out to Beetle, my friend, who actually lives around my corner. And um, we met here in Vienna. Um, he is really uh, very knowledgeable about uh, Android low level stuff and uh, embedded systems and embedded uh, computing. So yeah, it's clear why he comes with that question, because it's just normal for him. Yeah. And um, but uh, of course, we try to, to answer every question we can. And uh -huh. Yeah, we answered it. Great. It was an awesome last question for that one. Yeah, and I did see we had a lot of questions go through in live chat today. So if your question wasn't answered, you still want an answer from yours truly. Ping me directly at Universal Superbox on Telegram or Riot Matrix. I'm on matrix.org. So um, you can ping me at either of those. I'll try to answer your question or get you in contact with someone who can. Thank you, everyone, for watching this episode of, or listening, of the Ubuntu, no, Ubuntu Touch q and <laughs> I'm a little rusty, guys. The um, waffle got him. The waffle got to me. <laughs> um, you can find us throughout the week on so many places. We have a Mastodon. We have moved on Mastodon to uh, Framasoft's instance. Twitter, Facebook. Uh, Instagram, Matrix, and Telegram. And I think Google I Plus. missed one. Google, no. <laughs> Not anymore. It's still up, though. For a few weeks. Yeah. Whew. Other than that, I'd like to thank you all again for watching. We will see you in two weeks or so when we will have another great round of news and questions for discussion on the Ubuntu Touch Q&A. Bye. 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 Slap the like button. There you go.